For the last few weeks I've been talking about basically philosophical topics. I'm now going to switch back to talking about politics, specifically about politics rather than economics. And the two videos I'm preparing now will be based on a talk I gave in Stockholm about eight years ago, but updated slightly. And I'm talking about ideas of leadership and democracy in the history of the socialist and communist movement and ideas of the transition to socialism and or what you would now call a political revolution as they've developed and how where we go from where we are now to the future We have to take into account that the Marxist movement has been spectacularly unsuccessful in bringing about what it originally hoped, which was a transition to socialism in developed capitalist countries. It was very successful in doing that in less developed countries, but has failed in the areas we're expected to do best. And this fundamentally requires us to think through why that is and what kind of strategy could be applied to deal with that situation. So I'm going to start off by looking at the ideas that were initially put forward in the Communist Manifesto about democracy. In the manifesto, it was said that the communists don't form a separate party opposed to other working class parties, that they have no interests separate from and apart from those of the working class as a whole, and don't set up any sectarian principles of their own by which to shape the proletarian movement. Now, that obviously ceased to be the case in the 20th century, when they very definitely did set up separate parties opposed to other working class parties and they had principles of their own with which they did attempt to shape the whole working class movement so that these general aims came to be modified as time went on. People sometimes think that the concept of a vanguard or avant-garde party originated with the Russian Social Democrats and Lenin in the early years of the 20th century. But you can see the, ve the same idea is clearly being put forward right back at the very start, where it says the communists therefore are on one hand practically the most advanced and resolute section of the working class parties of every country, and that section which pushes forward all the others. On the other hand, theoretically, they have over the great mass of the proletariat the advantage of clearly understanding the line of march, the conditions and the ultimate general results of the, the proletarian movement. Now that summarises the idea of a vanguard. It also summarises quite well the position that communist parties did take up in countries like Britain, Germany and Sweden in the period after the Second World War. They attempted to base themselves on that position, that they didn't set themselves up as a sectarian party against the, the big social democrat parties, but attempted to push them forward. What then did the communists set as their immediate aim back in the 1840s. Well, their immediate aim was democracy. It says the immediate aim of the communists is the same as that of all other proletarian parties. The formation of the proletariat into a class, the overthrow of bourgeois supremacy and the conquest of political power by the proletariat. We've seen above that the first step in the revolution of the working class is to raise the proletariat to the position of ruling class to win the battle of democracy. Now, 
there's terms here raising the proletariat to the position of ruling class which prefigure terms which were later popularized by the Blanquis of a, a workers dictatorship the idea that the working class will become the ruling class in society it's understood that at that point the proletariat was not a class it had to be formed as a distinct class in society by the process of political struggle so that it is politics and political struggle that makes a mass of individuals act in a collective way for their common interest and therefore the formation of classes is not seen as an economic process it's primarily a political process which bases itself on economic preconditions the proletariat existed but it was not formed into a class and it was the job of politics to form it into the class it must conquer political power it must become the ruling class and this process of raising the working class to the position of ruling class is identified with the winning of democracy it's not seen as something opposed to democracy it's not a question of dictatorship as opposed to democracy the working class becoming the ruling class was democracy what then did the authors of the communist manifesto mean by democracy well the language it uses is a language based on ancient political philosophy the word proletariat for example comes from ancient Rome the word democracy comes from ancient Greece today we see democracy as being very different from proletarian rule but a hundred years 160 years ago words had a different meaning to the upper classes of the day democracy and mob rule were the same thing what educated people thought about democracy was heavily influenced by their reading of the ancient Greek authors Aristotle had emphasized that democracy didn't mean majority rule instead it meant by the rule of the poor rule by the artisans and those of mechanical occupations as he as it's put he even gives examples saying suppose there was a society with two rich people for every poor person and there the rich people ruled no one in his right mind would call that a democracy because democracy means rule by the poor not rule by the rich and it's only circumstances by which the poor are everywhere many and the rich are few that causes people to confuse the two in fact it's arguable I'm not a I can't read ancient Greek but people can tell me that the word demos and the Latin word proles has very similar common connotations in those days so democracy and proletarian rule actually amount to Latin and Greek equivalents of one another okay let's move on from the early 19th century to the late 19th century and the Communist Party in Germany had been suppressed in the 1850s and when a socialist movement rose up to replace the earlier communist movement it was social democracy and this then became the orthodoxy of the the, 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 the left movement in, in, in Europe um, now let's look at its founding program the Airfoot program see what that said about democracy I'm giving points from the Airfoot program it calls for direct legislation through the people by means of the rights of proposal and rejection self-determination and self-government of the people in realm state province and parish election of magistrates by the people with responsibility to the people annual voting of taxes 
Education of all to bear arms. Militia in the place of standing army. Decision by popular representatives on questions of war and police. Settlement of all international disputes by arbitration. Note that this is extremely radical and it involves direct participatory democracy, something that later social democracy forgot. Um, it does call for the election of magistrates. It doesn't call for election of officers. Now, why do I mention that? Because in ancient democracies, decisions were taken by direct popular vote and elections were restricted to the election of military commanders. Now, if we look at the measures that they're demanding there, very few of those have actually been won. In general, existing republics don't have direct legislation by the people. Insofar as they have election of magistrates by the people, you have some of that in countries like the United States, but not all officials are elected. The people don't get to annually vote on taxes. There is some provision to have decisions of, of by popular representatives on questions of war and peace. In theory, that is the case in the United States. In practice, it isn't. The United States has, in principle, the idea of a popular militia, but it's not a popular militia in the place of the standing army. It's alongside the standing army, and it is not effective and under democratic popular control. Nowadays, people tend to think of Lenin and the Russian Social Democrats as being to the left of the German Social Democrats. But if you actually look at their programme before the First World War, it's arguably less radical and somewhat to the right. The 1903 RSDLP programme is obviously stylistically modelled on the effort programme, but it doesn't have the radical commitment to direct legislation by the people and direct voting of taxes. Their objectives were limited to what they called a democratic republic, um, with a, a legislative assembly consisting of representatives of the people in a single chamber, a unicameral legislature, uh, with elected by universal, equal and direct suffrage of all citizens, men and women, over the age of 20, secret ballot, right of every voter to be elected, biannual parliaments, salaries to be paid, by, paid to the people's representatives. Now, it's very questionable whether a constitution of the t sort that the Russian Social Democrats were agitating for really was democratic in the sense used by Aristotle and Marx. It is describing the kind of structure that all the European states adopted after the Second World War, or in the case of places like Greece and uh, and. Spain, not until the 1970s, but it is a state in which you have a legislature that is elected and this is seen as being the representatives of the people. That is not the same thing as the people themselves voting on things and we know that in practice these legislators are always dominated by the moneyed interest. In principle, they claim to be representing the people in general, but in practice, 
they represent overwhelmingly the wealthy. We now go on to the war in the Russian Revolution. And at this point, the Russian Social Democrats radicalize their position. They now give more emphasis to the police and the standing army being abolished. Um, officials are not only going to be elected, but also subject to recall. Um, they'll only they'll be paid, but only paid an average wage. And parliamentary re institutions are gradually going to be replaced by Soviets, which act as both legislative and executive bodies. So saying that the, you would not have a separate executive. The three key points are that parliamentary representation will be replaced by Soviet representation, representative subject to recall, workers paid more than no more than the average wage. And if you ask any or ninety percent of Marxists nowadays what the Marxist principles of democracy are, they would summarize it in this. They would summarize it in these demands. The recall principle was derived from the commune and was incorporated in the constitution of the USSR. And for that matter, it was also incorporated into the constitution of several of the states in the USA, like Arizona. And it, in recent years, it has gained some purchase, at least verbally, from existing political parties. For instance, in the 200 and 2010 election in the UK, all the main parties said they were in favour of introducing the right of recall to the UK constitution. They didn't actually do it, but they said they were in favour of it. And I don't think if they had done it, it would have made any difference. It's mainly of use in dealing with manifest corruption and perhaps for dealing with manifestly broken election pre premises, promises. But it, it's a, a, an institution with a lot of inertia. It requires a lot of constituents to sign a demand for recall and then requires a ballot. And in constitutions where it exists, whether it's the Soviet Union or, for that matter, in China, where, which, where they have the right to it, or in American states, it's almost never used. There's no evidence that this is a particularly effective mechanism. The next innovation of the 1917 RSDLP program was the proposal that parliamentary government be replaced by Soviet government. Now Soviets or councils are bodies that are spontaneously thrown up in revolutions against autocracies. We've seen them come about in Paris in 1871, in Petrograd in 1917 or 1905 as well for that matter. They arose in Munich in, in 1919. They, they arose in Lisbon in 1975. Under certain circumstances, the formation of these councils can lead to a revolutionary situation. But they can only do that if the army and navy mutiny and come under the command of these new councils. That didn't happen in Paris in 1871, or it only happened locally within Paris itself, didn't happen in Munich in 1919, it didn't happen when similar councils were formed in the north of Italy in 1919 and 1920. So you not only need councils, but you need a mutiny of the armed forces such that the members of the armed forces join the councils and it becomes possible for these councils to give orders 
to military units. And they're only effective at all if determined insurrectionists lead them. The relative success for a few months in Paris in 1871 was due to the fact that the Blanquist played a leading role in it. The success of the Russian Revolution in 1917 is because the Leninists played a leading role in it. In general, these councils don't necessarily act decisively. In practice, these councils are only able to be successful to the extent that they lead not to mass democracy, but to the formation of a revolutionary aristocracy. Now, you can try the following experiment. If you take a polystyrene, foam polystyrene cup, fill it with, for, with cold water and place it in, micro, in a microwave. Turn the oven on for maybe about 60 seconds and then tip in a teaspoon of instant coffee. What will happen is that suddenly the cup will boil over as the instant coffee hits it. The microwave superheats the water to just above 100 degrees. The entry of the coffee granules into the water nucleates the formation of bubbles of steam and the whole mass bubbles over in a phase change. Revolutions involve a similar phase change. External events, for example, in 1917, the privation of war, raise the emotional energy of the population till it's superheated. Then some minor event causes a sudden and turbulent outburst. All the stored emotional energy is then put to work breaking down the old bounds of behaviour, breaking down the old behaviour patterns. So the process is at once deterministic and chaotic. You have a deterministic phase in that pressure has to build up. There has to be stress built up, whether it's by war, privation, what have you. That slowly builds up, but the point at which it bursts over is unpredictable and chaotic un and its outcome is undeterminable. Now, a social group, any large group of people, can only act coherently in a chaotic situation if it has some coordinating mechanism. There's an old saying from the first von Moltke that no battle plan survives contact with the enemy. That was evident in the First World War. Each of the belligerent powers had plans for invading one another. And within days those, powers had, those plans had broken down. And similarly, no political party that follows a single fixed programme can succeed in chaos. You have a programme of what you're going to do, and in a chaotic situation it just doesn't fit. The Bolsheviks succeeded because they were quickly able to come up with concrete economic problems to the concrete economic measures for the problems that people faced. These are summarised in, in Lenin's pamphlet, The Impending Catastrophe and How to Combat It. The Bolshevik leadership understood something what took the Imperial General Staffs four years to learn. That if you were to succeed In a turbulent situation, you need initiative and flexibility. You cannot do this 
by sticking to a fixed plan. In Russia in 1917, you had a perfect conjunction of circumstances. You had what amounted to a workers' general staff who had the skill and initiative to plot a course of action. And you also had the formation of a structure which allowed this small general staff to command large armies or large forces of people. And this was due to the hierarchical character of the Soviet system of delegates. Now, on the one hand, Soviet or Bolshevik leadership was essential for the Soviets to take power. And on the other hand, the Soviet constitutional structure was uniquely suited to leadership by a revolutionary aristocracy like the Bolshevik party. Now, suppose, consider this diagram here. Each circle represents a thousand people. Several thousand people here elect people to local Soviets. The local Soviets then elect delegates to the All-Russian Congress of Soviets. At the bottom, you've got millions of people. The All-Russian Congress has actually thousands of members, but a, 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 a council of thousands of members can't actually be what uh, the Bolsheviks claimed, a, a combined legislative and executive committee. It has to then appoint a smaller body, a central executive committee, 200 people in that. But even that is too large. It can't practically take decisions. So that then appoints delegates to the Council of People's Commissars, only 17 people. So you have here an inverted command structure, or at least it's supposed to be an inverted command structure. A structure that's supposed to feed information upwards. But in practice what it does, it elects people upwards, but provides an excellent mechanism by which decisions taken at the top level can be multiplied down through the hierarchy and produce large effects. Suppose a member of the Russian Social Democratic Labour Party was 50 times more likely to be nominated and four times more likely to be elected if nominated than a random non-party citizen. Because random people who are not in any party are less likely to put themselves forward for election and since they're not standing on a platform of a known party are less likely to be elected. That will give a 200-fold over-representation of the party in the local Soviets. If the RSDLP made up one the thousand of the Russian population, perhaps plausible, they would already get 20% of the local Soviets. And each level up the election process, your chances of nomination, your chances of election are boosted by being a member of and a representative of a political party. The indirect election system amplifies any inequalities of votes at a lower level and you end up or you ended up with total domination of the Council of Commissars by the RSDLP. This sort of total domination was bound to occur. You were bound to get total domination by one party or another. It might have been the socialist revolutionaries instead of uh, the Bolsheviks. Martov might have become the person everyone knew about Ron Lenin. But the structure of the system was such that one party was going to dominate. So you start off with a system of Soviet democracy. You then 
quickly form a Bolshevik aristocracy due to the concentrating effects of the Soviet indirect system of election. From the late later period of the 19, late 1920s, maybe through to the period of Khrushchev, you can say you have a revolutionary monarchy, revolutionary tyranny. This then degenerated into a bureaucratic oligarchy from the 1960s to the 1990s, and then into a, a plutocratic oligarchy, which now rules in Russia. So why do so many revolutionary republics become monarchies? We've said, why did the Soviet system lead to revolutionary aristocracy? That was a method of election. But why do you end up with a strong man? Why do you have Cromwell, Napoleon, Stalin, Mao, Kim Il-sung, Castro for that matter? From the plebeian standpoint, only a strong man with dictatorial power can hope to advance their interests against a powerfully entrenched upper class. So that's one of the reasons for the appeal of a Caesar, for example. If there are external enemies, mobilization for defense favors the development of a supreme national commander. And again, you see that with Napoleon, Castro or Kim Il-sung. And finally, states with cabinets of, of ministers or commissars require someone who's a prime minister or first secretary to break deadlocks when powerful ministers argue. So any system based on a cabinet or council of people's commissars ends up with one of them being dominant. Now, all of these factors played their role as the USR went into the Stalin monarchy. By monarchy, I'm not meaning hereditary monarchy. I'm just meaning monarchy in the sense of rule or decision-taking by one person, or one person having a preeminent role in decision-taking. The Given that you have a revolutionary aristocracy, aristocracy after 1918. You have a cabinet government populated by able, determined and intelligent people. The disputes and alliances arose which needed the stabilization which could only come about by the rise of a single leader. Then there was an external threat. The country was under constant threat of invasion and the need to mobilize the economy for defense again favors a single leader you see that this still in korea for example the that and the need to broaden political support for the communist party in an agricultural country led to the policy of extraordinary rapid industrialization and we see now in Russia, the widespread plebeian nostalgia for Stalin, we see a nostalgia for a, a, a strong leader who can take on the oligarchs. So, in my next talk, I'll be looking at, given that background, where do we go from there?